Okay. Uh, so I'm going to pick it up where I left. Uh, we had stated two theorems. Uh, first theorem was nothing but just looking at uh, lots of coins tossing effectively. And the second was uh, trying to argue that there is one simple uh, way to determine what is the what is the number of samples that we need, and that number of samples should depend on something what I would call a covering number, a covering number which is just uh, a property of probability measure, um, an underlying space, of course, through that. And the way we'll define that, and actually, thank you uh, for correcting <laughs> correcting me in the sense that. Uh, the easier way to state it is, well, there exists, let's say, n, capital N balls, uh, each of radius r at some, uh, centered at certain points, so that the union of, the probability of the union is at least one minus delta. And that's exactly uh, the right way to think, write the definition. I got carried away thinking about the next step. Uh, okay. And what that says, and I don't know why I erased that. Oh, I see. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, this was less than or equal to epsilon plus three delta times y max minus y. Okay. Yes. So, in some way, these are non-parametric methods, right? So, usually, sort of non-parametric methods don't have generalization bound that are coming from that form because usually you will try to net the f space of models, right? Rather than um, so, uh, maybe this is step towards that, but then that'll be too lofty to say. So, uh, I, I guess so. That, yeah. So theorem one, you can say that sort of it is lower bound, but or you can say that sort of look, if this is the probability of the ball, this is the number of samples you need. Yeah. So depending on how you, so usually sort of the way, let's say uh, you open up a book by uh, Tsibako and look at the most general version, or uh, there's an uh, actually more interest. So again, I have a reference which I'll, uh, I think it's Devroy et al. Uh, in 2015, um, then there will be some condition that you would put that would make effectively that type of argument a little nicer. Good, so implications. Thank you for asking the right question. Okay, so let's suppose that sort of, uh, let's say here is a result we have, right? We have that sort of k should scale like one over epsilon square. So. Okay, so I'm going to assume that delta is equal to, so let's just set for a second. Let's just set for a second, delta is equal to uh, epsilon by 3 y max minus y min, and let's say y max minus y min is 1, so really delta is like epsilon over 3. Uh, just to keep things simple, then that means that sort of that is no more than 2 epsilon, and say 2 epsilon is my epsilon. So really what this result says, uh, this result says that k should scale like one over epsilon square log one over epsilon, okay? And n should scale like whatever that covering number is, n times 2k over delta. So k scales like one over epsilon square log one over epsilon. And delta is like scaling like one over epsilon, uh, delta is scaling like epsilon, so effectively it's one over epsilon cube log one over epsilon, okay? And then there is an n. Is everything okay? All right, so, uh, so really it's the n that we want to determine to understand sort of what is the scaling you get as a function, uh, as epsilon. So you want to get epsilon, k is my parameter, so it's not really dependent on the samples. N is the really thing that we care about. That is small n and capital N. So let's take one simple example. It's like a canonical example. Think of distribution over features coming from one dimensional space uniform. Okay, it's all really nice. Let's assume holder of this form to get rid of the constants out of the picture. The corresponding uh, H star, which depends on epsilon like that, 
would, uh, okay, putting it other way, what you would have is that you got something like epsilon by two net, so that sort of the the diameter is of order epsilon. So that's h star delta is like epsilon. So the question is how many balls of radius epsilon do you need to cover your interval of length one, or one minus delta? Well, one over epsilon. Right? So that means that your n should be like one over epsilon, which means that what you will get is that this implies that small n should scale like one over epsilon to power four log one over epsilon, okay? Now, in more generally, under strong density conditions and so on and so forth, what this type of argument would tell you uh, is that uh, you need number of samples that scale like, let me write this way, epsilon root to power minus d over alpha plus three. Okay. I'm ignoring logs. Okay. The optimal rate is known to be two okay. for strong density conditions. Now, strong density condition arguments actually explicitly utilize the fact that you have a really nice balls, okay? And this one is not utilizing that. So what, what's happening really is that this, in generality, you're losing one, one over epsilon. So, sorry? Yeah, everything else is up. So, uh, putting it the other way, right? Um, um, if I knew that sort of my probability measured really nice uh, structure like strong and density, then you can uh, change your argument a little bit and then you will get rid of plus one. That is, this indeed is coming because you're not assuming anything about the probability distribution, that plus one. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I, I don't remember. It will be hard for me to state because um, it is complicated a little bit, but you can sort of, uh, that has precisely. Roughly speaking, what it means is that um, there is some form of uniform lower bound. Okay, or what are the things that matter? And things that don't matter, there is just useless. Okay, so really, uh, uniform is a nice way to think about it. When you, it matters, you got sort of nice uh, density, which is uniform. And when it don't, doesn't matter, it's zero. So that's the best case scenario. Now, imagine you sort of generalize this with all sorts of parameters and make it, then you get strong density assumption. Okay, so yes, so generality loses your thing, but it's by plus one, okay? Now, the same argument you can sort of repeat, uh, and let's say we try to apply it in the context of reinforcement learning to use uh, Q learning with nearest neighbors, and you again, you lose plus one there compared to the best, um, uh, best uh, uh, parametric uh, um, you can get. Uh, and again, sort of, that comes because of this type of generality of argument. Ah, so, yeah, so let's suppose that you want to learn Q function. Uh, you want to learn Q function where you have state and action, and now it, they're not discrete, so you're not doing tabular, but you have um, uh, your space, uh, so your state space is continuous, which means you will never repeat as is any finite trajectory. Uh, and now you want to sort of learn the Q function for every possible state, so that means, um, and action. In that case, what you would like to do is somehow, given observations, you want to learn Q function through some kind of um, as a supervised learning. So you got you've seen some trajectory, and based on that, you want to sort of determine what to do. And okay. naturally, so you just write down basically the Q uh, iteration but now with the nearest neighbor operator rather than generic uh, uh, in the discrete case where you just write down as a sort of the tabular uh, evolution. Anyway, so that's basically uh, what this is doing. So now let's just sort of go through the proof of this. Uh, Ooh, sorry, let's leave it here, write down.
All right, so again, whole argument is to say that, well, look, I want to look for balls that are not too small. And I want to argue that the number of balls cannot be, not all balls can be small. And one way to say that is, look, if I have enough sample, so if this is my set of my balls, let's say uh, that I'm covering, obtaining using this kind of covering, uh, each of radius, small enough radius, and I've got enough points, then by effectively pigeonhole principle, right, the, at least one of them should have enough of those points. Okay? And then I would like to argue that that type of argument is sufficient. That is, that's not too bad. That is, I've got space. I've got space which I can cover nicely. And now I'm going to put more points than the number of, uh, uh, number of uh, disks I need to cover it. So, of course, there will be at least one disk which will have enough points. Question is, why is that sufficient? Because maybe that doesn't mean that enough, you know, because what about sort of the remaining uh, other disks, right? So it needs a little bit of argument. Okay. All right, so let's do that. Sorry? Well, just simple algebra. <laughs> so I'll just do simple algebra. It's literally a half a page. There's, there's not much that's there. All right. But again, sort of basic point is that, look, uh, if I did that, you would say, I'm going to find you a point X that's terrible, okay? But uh, if you're going to find me an X that's terrible, then sort of uh, my whole argument will go away. And I'll say, okay, well, not all X's can be terrible because my space is finitely covered in some sense with the type of balls that I'm looking for. So if I have enough points, at least one of the disks will have enough points. But remember, the reason I'm getting these enough points in that disk is because that's what my Px is telling me. So that means if I'm going to compute expectation with respect to Px, most of my mass must be in that disk. So that's the, so let's just, I mean, I can sort of leave it at that actually, if you want. Uh, let's use a little bit of calculation. It never harms, just to make sure that we got proof right. Okay, so I'll start with here and continue. Okay, so again, uh, because we assume that X is Polish, and uh, what Polish means that all the probability measures on that are, are tight, which means that for every probability measure, there exists a compact set. Uh, you choose delta, you will find a compact set with, so that m at least one minus delta mass is within that. Once you have a compact set, by definition, you got a finite cover, which means that the covering number is finite. So now let's assume that that finite covering exists. Now what I'm going to do is, let's say, so you got this, you gave me this finite covering Bn, where it's uh, covering of this type, okay? That is, it's covering most of the mass, and each ball is radius h, which is like this, okay? Now let me see, what are the bad points here? Well, or what are the bad covers? The bad covers are, or bad disks are the one such that, that doesn't satisfy that condition. That is, um, rewriting that condition, Px of Bi is less than, and again, sort of, I'm going to, uh, uh, so if that condition, the top condition there was satisfied, Px of ball is greater than or equal to 8 over n times delta. But it doesn't satisfy that, which means it's less than. Uh, 8 over n times log 1 over delta. So these are the bad things. Okay, now I can sort of say that, look, I've got entire space uh, or entire support. I will divide that support into three parts. Okay, the so first part is the one where uh, three uh, <laughs> parts. First part is where this is union of all bad balls. Okay, the E2 is union of all balls minus the union of bad balls, which is E1, okay? And of course, E3 is the support of X minus E1 union E2, or union of all balls, okay? I just, now, of course, I know that probability of E3, Px of E3 is less than or equal to delta by definition, 
And whenever my x falls into this, let's say my error is terrible, it can't be uh, more terrible than y max minus y min. So that's why it's delta times y max minus y min, and three will come somehow, okay? So that's basically what's happening there. As far as this is concerned, um, well, when x falls here, again, I may not be able to guarantee that, but I want to make sure that this is small. But when I'm in this world, actually that's good because this is exactly the one that's satisfying my condition of that theorem one, which means that when I'm in this world, my error will be small, smaller than epsilon, okay? And so that means that that will give me this. And again, even though this guy's probability is not one, one is a good upper bound of that. Okay, so that's roughly what's happening. So all that I now need to know is that really worry about this and argue that the probability of this is small. All right, so let's see, how, how does that happen? Okay, so, well, so, let's see, probability of x of E1, well, this is nothing but no more than number of bad things times maximum over I probability of EI where I is in bad, right? Do that. Right? That's because it's just union of bad things. Well, how many bad things can be there? At most N. Okay, so that's fine too. Well, the way we have defined this guy, this cannot be more than 8 over N times log. 1 over delta. So that means that if I have n uh, larger than this quantity, by whatever factor, 1 over that would be the bound on that. Okay. And that's it. So that means that what we'll do is we'll say that n is greater than or equal to uh, 8n log 1 over delta times, uh, what is it, sorry? Where is n? Times 1 over delta here. Times 1 over delta here. And given that's the case, now I've argued that this is smaller than delta. Uh, this is smaller than delta. On the E2, everything is fine, so we got what? Okay, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so um, uh, short answer is at least the way we did analysis, uh, it did not. Okay. Um, yeah. Any other question? No, no, I'm just wondering whether because we have all the things here in the paper, it's not true. That's correct. Mm -hmm. So, so. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, I think sort of the intuition would be roughly like this, that it won't improve beyond constant factor, roughly speaking. So think of it this way. So if you took it a uniform setup, right, that explains, uh, because your first and the kth guy, right, they'll be within that much of a distance. So they're roughly in the same range. So the whatever bias the first guy induces, and maybe log, but... Yeah, so there's a variance that comes because of noise, and then there's a bias because of the distance. And let's even assume that I knew exactly distance, I knew exact dependence on the distance and so on and so forth, but I could not, uh, let's say, use that algorithmically to do correctly. Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of, yeah. Sorry? 
Well, H star came into the proof because that that theorem was true only for that H that choice of H star. How many points I need, or how close I need to be? Yeah. Yeah. So there are lower bounds. I'm not covering them, uh, but implicitly I I used or I appealed to that lower bound, some meta lower bound, by somebody saying that well, if you have a strong density assumption, then uh, this minus d to power alpha plus 2 is necessary and there is an analysis that shows that it's sufficient. Yep. Uh, so, sorry, very, what is, where is that? Oh, yeah, so good. Um, yeah, I see. Uh, that comes, Okay, I'm trying to sort of remember. So it's definitely not coming from. Okay, sorry. So it it comes because of sort of it comes from because of theorem one's uh, connection. So here, so you see, uh, I want I can't have k larger than half times n times. So n has to, small n has to be greater than or equal to two k times the probability of the ball. So that's roughly where it's coming. And that is because if I don't have that, then I won't be able to argue that my um, my estimator concentrates around its own mean. And then, so that's the kind of a bias, uh, or rather the variance is small. And then the question is how much is the bias that's determined by how large is the k? And how large is the k depends on, uh, uh, or choice of k determines how far I am from my actual thing, which might determine how much is my bias. Good. So maybe. Good. So let's. So let. So I think this is a perfect time to transition. So it's eleven twenty. I've got forty more minutes. Let's say I spend roughly ten fifteen minutes odd on three topics. Uh, one is how to choose k. Two is uh, how to. Let's suppose all of this is great. We know exactly how to choose k. How do we implement this? Okay, and then three is okay. All of that is great, but how did I figure out the distance? In some sense, distance is hidden into my conditional probability. In some sense, but how do I know that? Maybe I don't know that. So I will talk about each one of three of them, and each one of them is, uh, at least to my um, uh, the way I would look at it, is each one of them is open that is not fully settled. So the great opportunities for people interested in the topic. So that's, yeah, yeah. So there's, as I said, there are three algorithms, right? The ball nearest neighbor, the k nearest neighbor, and the kernel. Like a soft version, or you uh, do threshold either based on distance or based on number of points. And all of them are roughly the same. Exactly. Yeah. So there is a stream of work that's especially recently that people have done using the Lepsky's method, the same Lepsky's uh, that uh, that uh, polling spoke about in the first day of the class, uh, the first day of her lecture, sorry, first day of the workshop and during her lecture. Um, here, in some sense, you can think of parameters being, uh, so if you think of k as a parameter with e epsilon fixed and n fixed, then you can think of doing Lepsky's. But if you start thinking of epsilon also varying and so on, then so you've got two parameters. So Lepsky is not easy. That's why there are some interesting papers, but again, it's not fully satisfactory. There's another paper that appeared two years back, very simplistic, which very neat. So I thought I'll walk you through that. Uh, it's not fully analyzed, and um, there is a simple toy model that I will analyze it for you, uh, which seemed to do the right thing. Okay. So hopefully, if you're interested, maybe it should be uh, analyzable. All right, so this was paper by um, Anaya and um, Anaya and somebody. 2016, it was appeared in NIPS. Uh, the way it goes is as follows. It says that, look, I want to, I have an estimator. How to choose to. 
say, well, let's say I have an estimator eta hat, where eta hat of x is nothing but summation i alpha i y i and um, or alpha i of now we can sort of say ordered version of y i of x such that alpha i are non-negative, they all sum up to 1, okay. So, this is, uh, this is my estimator, okay. So, how should I choose the alpha? That is a question. Um, is there a way I can sort of choose these alphas really, really well? And in particular, if I knew exactly, let us say, what the holder uh, parameters are, then actually going through this proof will tell you that there is a clean way to do that. That is exactly great point. So they say, okay, fine. So they have an intermediate answer. Okay, so let me tell you the intermediate answer, and then we can sort of uh, argue where to sorry. I is near. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So they say, okay, fine. Let's say uh, I don't know these alphas. So say, okay, fine. That's fine. All right. So let's just sort of start at least discussion. Um, so this is an estimator. I want to minim. I want to do two things. I want. I have an error. I want to minimize the bias and I want to minimize the uh, variance. If alpha i's are uniform over all, let's say thing, my bias would be very large because I'm going to take somebody way far out there and using that person's value to do that. The bias is large, which means I shouldn't have too much uniform. But if alpha is too concentrated, let's say on the only